Hello, everyone. Welcome to Confluence of Hearts, a global summit on true self, brave connections, and a love-led world. This summit brings together over 20 trailblazing speakers, including renowned authors, visionary leaders, and pioneering clinicians in a transformative five-day event. I'm your host, Dr. Mavis Tsai, a research scientist at the University of Washington and founder of the nonprofit organization, Awareness, Courage, and Love Global Project. Together, we'll explore cutting edge insights on reconnecting with our true selves and our fellow humans, dismantling antiquated societal structures, harnessing our passions and gifts, and co-creating a thriving future for generations to come by contributing our highest selves to the world. I'm really thrilled to be speaking with Paul Merriman today. Paul is a nationally recognized authority on mutual funds, index investing, and asset allocation. After retiring in 2012 from Merriman Wealth Management, which he founded in 1983, Paul created the Merriman Financial Education Foundation. His foundation is dedicated to providing do-it-yourself investors of all ages with free information and tools to make better investment decisions. Paul is the author of eight books, including We're Talking Millions, 12 Simple Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. He writes a regular column for Market Watch, a Dow Jones investment company, and produces a multi-award winning weekly podcast, Sound Investing. He is the 2021 recipient of the American Association of Individual Investors, James Clunan Award for Excellence in Investment Education. Western Washington University has established the Merriman Financial Literacy Program, a program dedicated to making all Western graduates financially literate. At his website, paulmerriman.com, he provides an abundance of free books and over 700 podcasts, videos, and articles. Paul's profound commitment to spreading financial literacy goes beyond mere numbers and investment strategies. Through his tireless efforts to educate individuals on securing their finances, his work illuminates how financial wisdom can serve as a cornerstone for living a fulfilled, passion-driven life. With a heart as vast as his expertise, Paul emerges as a guiding light of knowledge and compassion, steering countless individuals toward a brighter, more secure future. The title of his interview is Balancing Hope and Reason, The Lifetime Path to Successful Investing. Paul, just so happy that you're here with me today. Yeah, Mavis, it's wonderful. You know, it's it's it is it, it is amazing how random life is, and how uh, the chance meeting that we had many decades ago has come back to hopefully change the lives of uh, of other folks. It's wonderful, and thank you, thank you for it. I want to let the audience know how I met you. So I had just gotten out of graduate school and my parents had really taught me about the importance of mm. financial literacy and saving for a bright future. And so I was checking out investment advisors. I wasn't very well off, but I was saving and I was starting to make money out of graduate school. And so I, I had three financial, maybe even five financial advisors I was going to check out. And I went to, I went to a talk that you gave, you said two things that made me think, this is my man. And I didn't even bother checking out the other financial advisors. You said mm. that you lost sleep at night because you cared so much about your clients' money and making sure that they were going to do well by you. And the second thing you said is that you were adopting a little girl from China, as people know in Chinese. And the idea that you wanted to give back by adopting a little girl from China, that was it. Like, yeah, I'm going with you. And it was such a wise decision. So, or lucky. Or lucky, maybe, yeah. <laughs> wise and lucky. <laughs> so... So tell me how you became the man that you are, because I, I really think you have this incredible balance of being driven by both heart 
and mind. How, how did you bond the two? How did you get to be so financially savvy, mm -hmm. but to be so heartful about it? Well, I, I, I found the topic of uh, investing and money um, very interesting early on in my life. Um, it, it, it's it's probably uh, uh, too simple to say this, but I had somebody in my life that that didn't particularly care for me, and um, uh, and the one thing that he never understood was money, and it just seemed it seemed so right to uh, to become an expert in that particular topic. And I had another person in my life uh, who was so special to me that uh, that said you. Whoever you meet in life, you treat them with kindness and respect. And learning about money and learning about respecting others, uh, they just kind of went together. And the fact is, Mavis, is that a lot of people don't like to talk about their money. They 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 feel it's a, it's a dirty subject, but it is in every single part of our life at some level. And uh, I really believe uh, that if there is a place that creating peace of mind would be really great, would be around financial topics and understanding. And, you know, I run into a lot of people who, who just immediately are not interested, do not want to make any of those decisions. But I have some tricks I can use, I think, to help them think again, because it is it is such an important part of our lives. You're absolutely right that it's in every part of our lives, and most people don't like to talk about it. When I was starting my career, I was seeing clients and I'm just reading a lot of books, and there was a book entitled The Last Taboo mm. in Therapy. Hmm. what do you think it was yeah it was talking money, about money, money. it was talking yeah. about money yeah. yeah so so what what do you want our audience to know i i think there are probably a lot of people in this audience uh, focused on heart and soul and spirit and probably don't yeah. want to talk much about money so well you know those people actually are typically the kind that want to do something good for others and um, I got to say that there is a real payoff uh, for having more than you might have had had you not put a little work into this process. Because uh, I, I, my wife and I are able to do things for others because we have saved uh, diligently and, and prudently. Um, and, and the other part is, I think that so much of the challenge for people is they think there's something complex about it. And we work hard. I mean, we work harder at this than anything to show people how dirt simple investing can be so that it's kind of in your life and you have to think about it for a little bit. And then you get by that understanding of why it's not important to think about it every day, but get it set up on day one for the rest of your life and go about your business. It doesn't have to doesn't have to rule your life, but but it it can ruin your life if you don't take the right uh, early steps. And again, they're simple. That in that book about we're talking millions. You know, these are twelve simple steps anybody can understand, and literally each one worth a million. You know that is that is not. Uh, an, an idle comment. History has proven that, and we just want people to understand that basic history and then not not make it the focus of their life. There are more important things to do than to sit around and worry about money, but we can, can, you, can get there, I, I hope. Can you, can you take us through a few of those steps, please? Sure, sure. I, I think, and this is where this combination of of thinking and feeling, I think, is is important. Um, people feel a lot of things about money and what it represents. Uh, I want to focus to help them focus 
on the, the the part that has to do about the thinking part of money. And, and we could say that maybe the most important part of investing is to simply know the math of investing. If people understood the implication of saving a few dollars a month, and then you put that together with investing in something that historically, I mean, we can't know the past. Nobody knows the past. No investment advisor uh, knows the future. We can know the past, but we can't know the future. And, uh, and so we try to be really knowledgeable about the past. But if we just got average returns, that money growing on money over time can be tax-free. There's one of the 12 right there. You can invest money so that it grows tax-free. That's a really big deal. And a lot of people are scared to death of the stock market. Probably the biggest decision you're going to make as an investor, particularly a young investor, is whether to trust the bond market that is, you know, can be totally safe, at least in the mind of the investor, or whether we're going to trust the stock market. Now, we want you to trust it in a very special uh, way, but if we can get you to trust it, here's what we know. We know $100 invested in bonds uh, 96 years ago is today worth about $12,000. We know $100 invested in the what we call the S&P 500, 500 large companies, high quality companies generally, is worth about a million. Now wow. that is that is not the twelve thousand versus a million. And yes, and and wait, if, wait how many million way, did how many million did you say? Well, that's one hundred dollars to about one million. One million. But there are other kinds of stocks that are a little more risky that would today be worth 14 million plus since 1928. So, you know, once you know that, then you might ask, well, why don't people put their money in the stock market? Well, because it goes up and down on a daily basis. And when it's going down, people can feel like they're going broke. They're going to run out of money. It's going to it's going to disappear just like you went to Las Vegas and you and you put everything on red. The the, the reality is the very worst forty year period in the stock market was about a nine percent compound rate of return. The best was twelve point five. Now that means that we're talking about the long term, not the short term. Bonds are better for a day. Bonds are better for a week, maybe even a year or two. But stocks are the best. If you do it right, by the way, got to do it right. You can't be speculating. You can't be gambling. You need to invest. In fact, I want people to invest like the multimillionaires invest. And that is to be broadly diversified. Another one of the 12 is to be broadly diversified. And if you're going to buy a mutual fund, then buying an index fund which is simply a fund that owns all of the companies inside a certain group, like large growth companies. You could just buy the index fund. And that fund, because it's an index fund, has a very, very low expense. You may make an extra half. You may make an extra 1% a year because you have that fund with a very low expense. I mean, these are all dirt simple decisions, Mavis, and, and, and not hard to make. Because when I teach high school classes, and I give people a choice, would you rather buy a mutual fund that has a load, and you have to give some of your money to somebody else, and it's going to grow in their pocket for the rest of your life rather than yours? Or would you rather buy a mutual fund that has no commission? What would the implications of that be over a lifetime? Well, it's a million dollar decision as it turns out and, and an easy one because everybody agrees with the idea that you don't want to pay a commission to somebody if you can make an intelligent decision to buy the right kind of mutual fund. And one of the challenges that people have 
is the people they go to oftentimes want you to buy the expensive fund instead of the cheaper fund. And that means they make more money. And the whole idea of what we're teaching is so that you do the best that you can. I don't mean you ask people to work for nothing, but to the extent that there's a choice and you got two gas stations on two corners and one is 10 cents a gallon cheaper, people are going to, especially engineers and people who like to count things, people are going to gravitate to the one that does has the lowest price. Then the only question, and here's a killer, and then I'll stop babbling here. <laughs> but here's, not, here's, the, here's, the, yeah. here's, what, here's what we know, that the mutual funds that are actively managed at higher expenses, with higher taxes, with less diversification, only one in 10 or 20 actively managed mutual funds can beat the index fund, which means I don't have to know anything about the companies. The company, the index fund owns all the companies. And I got more diversification, which means lower risk, lower expenses, which means more in my pocket, and less in taxes, everything to the best interest of the investor. And that's what we're trying to teach. What about socially conscious index funds? They're great. They're great. They're great. But you have the same, you have the same choices there. You have the choice of an actively managed fund or Vanguard, for example, has uh, basically an index fund with very, very low expenses and very fine returns. And we have to keep in mind, we, we have no idea what the future is going to bring uh, in the economy, in the stock market, in our politics. You know, things, things can turn out different than we might personally want. But what I want to make sure is if you want to be in socially responsible ESG funds, you want to make sure that, you've, that you pay attention to all those same decisions around uh, expenses and diversification. So out of the 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement, which which do you think, you may have already answered this, which is, which is the best? Well, I think a, a lot of people would say just the act of saving. And, uh, and, and I would agree with that, that it is most important uh, in terms of you starting to, to build the foundation of future wealth. One of the things that people don't get is for the first 10, maybe even 20 years, the real return of your portfolio will be the money that you put in there. Because you've taken it out of your life and you, by the way, we're not saying that you shouldn't spend it. We, we're saying you should spend it later. It's still to be spent or to help others, however we want to apply that. But the reality is the thing that has the biggest impact is that decision between the fixed income, the bonds and the stocks. And let me just give you a number. For every half a percent that you can increase the return, given a modest annual contribution, should make you, every half a percent, should make you an additional million dollars over your lifetime. Now, I want to make sure that people understand how I measure that million dollars. I measure it by how much you paid yourself out of that account in retirement, because that's part of the return. And then there's what you left to others when you passed on. Those are the two things we have to add together to see how much you really made on your investments. And what we know is when you add those two together, every half a percent generates a million to a million and a half more money in your retirement, or you leave to others, depending how frugal you want to be. And so when I talk about a bond making 5% and a stock or stock index making 10%, as it has since 1928, that's 5%. That's 10, 
10 half a percent advantages, which means it literally is going to add over $10 million to, uh, uh, to, to, to create uh, the, uh, uh, that half a percent, that, that extra yeah, half a percent. That's mind boggling. So why, why did you leave your, I guess it's a, it was a for-profit company to become a nonprofit to start a nonprofit company. Yeah. Well, I, there were a bunch of forces. I had the good fortune here again, a, a lucky uh, um, relationship turned into me doing a special for PBS for a pledge week uh, nationally. And that gave me a chance to teach millions of people, which I had never had before. And uh, I also love teaching. You mentioned about my concern <laughs> about making money for people and doing the right thing. And I, I, I've always said that my favorite two days of the week were Saturday and Sunday because the market wasn't open. You know, it didn't help people, but it also didn't hurt people. So I could sleep better on weekends than I could during the week. But I finally came to the point, I, I realized that what I really love doing, because I built the company by teaching and showing people how to do everything on their own. And if they didn't want to do it on their own, we were willing to do that for the investor at what we thought was a fair price. And, uh, and so now, for the last 10 plus years, I have been purely a teacher. I don't have to worry the same way at night as I used to. It's interesting because um, because I am just a teacher and I don't give personal advice, but I do everything that I know to show people how to do it on their own. And, um, and that's all I can do, particularly at 80 years of age. Uh, I know my years are numbered. And the, and the other thing, Mavis, is I used to have, we when I was in the business, we had about 2,000 plus families that we work for. Now I work for thousands and thousands of families. I don't know them like I, like I knew you and others that we worked for. But, but my, my intention is to, to change their financial future and to do it in a way that they have greater peace of mind. And some will and some won't. And by the way, if you don't find peace of mind doing it yourself, get yourself an investment advisor who knows the right things to do. Yeah, that was my next question is when does someone decide, oh, should I just do it myself or should I hire a financial advisor? Well, I, I, I think it is about whether you will tend to the discipline to do it or not. And if you won't, uh, then I, I think that you need to have the person who can maintain the discipline. Okay, what does this is, discipline involve, Paul? Yeah, there there is. And the discipline, by the way, we have three books that, three of the books that we recently wrote on our website. One of them is just about the, the emotional side of investing. I can tell you step by step the things you should do physically uh, to make your money go to work for you. But everybody that I've ever known that's been around this business very long understands that the biggest enemy is the face we see in the mirror in the morning. And that's because that person that we're looking at there has a hard time with a lot of the biases. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, I think, had 48 biases in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And many of those biases uh, are, are standing in the way of people's ability to be successful as an investor. And if you can't overcome those biases, let somebody who knows how to do it, do it. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody out there offering to do it for you would be my choice because I want that advisor to believe the same thing that I do about what works and what doesn't work. In, in in Wall Street and investing. Well, so, what are uh, some of these biases that don't work for people? Well, some people are overconfident. Some people think they know more than they know. Uh, I can 
I can tell you that nobody knows the future of the stock market. And yet people every day read articles, advertisements, watch it on CNBC, and they believe that these people actually know more than what more about what's going to happen, or that they actually do know what's going to happen. And that I'm smart enough to pick which one of those gurus is going to be the real winner. Well, how would I know which one of those gurus? Uh, I, I, I know that Lots of very famous, loud people who who yell and scream on TV have terrible track records. We know that. They're tracked and they don't do well, but they entertain well. And they give people a feeling of confidence that they can beat the market. There's so much money to be made simply being the market. You don't have to beat the market to make good money. You just need to be the market. And that confidence gets him in trouble. Other people, I just talked to my barber about a week ago, asked him, he's a young guy. I asked him how much money he's got in his IRA and what he and and what he's what he's going to invest in. Well he's not going to invest in the stock market. Why? Because he doesn't want to lose money. A lot of people are risk averse. And and also they have regret. They, they don't want to have regrets. They don't. They they don't want to face the reality that I'm a loser because I put money into something and then it went down. Well, when we think long term as we should about investing, then all that comes uh, in, into a clear focus that we shouldn't be looking at it on a short term basis. That's really hard for a lot of people to do. So a good advisor. They are not being paid to tell you a great asset allocation. They're being paid to keep you in that asset allocation, that combination of stocks and bonds that might be appropriate for you, and to keep you from jumping ship. And because you got to stay the course. It works if you stay the course. It does not work for people when they jump in and out of the market. And I think it's oh. fair also, Mavis, to add, a lot of people just don't want to fool with it. Now, I'm going to just, I, I, I'm going to bear my soul on this one, but this, this is the truth. I don't manage my own money. <laughs> I have an advisor who manages it. Why? One, because I don't want to focus on my money. It is the last thing that I want to focus on. And I don't mind paying somebody to do it for me. That's number one. Number two, I also struggle with fear of loss. And, and, and so I would be tempted. I had somebody call me uh, this morning, I think it was, about well, what happens if this uh, uh, all this artificial intelligence causes this and this bad thing to happen. I said, Look, a buy and holder is supposed to stay the course. I could understand why somebody may be afraid, whether it's a political decision people are making or a, a, a warfare, whatever it is that's going on in the world. You got to be able just to get rid of all of that and make the commitment to the long term to a portfolio that may or may not do what you want. There is also, and this is so important, Mavis, there's so much luck in this process, randomness. And I, and, and I really think what is here today, I'm here because of a random meeting with you many, many years ago. You attended a random presentation. You could have attended somebody else's presentation that you loved the night before you came to mind and you'd be somewhere else in the world right now. And, 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 and so the, the, the reality is that if you happen to invest Starting in 1975 until 1999, the market grew, the S&P 500, at 17.2% a year. That is an amazing return. That is more than twice the amount of money that you would have made at 10% because of compounding. On the other hand, after having seen that amazing 25-year track record, 
that people think they were really smart for having been in the market. Well, it was a random event. They were probably in the markets when they were born. But if you started in 2000 through the end of 2023, it's a 7% compound rate of return. So how are we, are we going to be lucky or unlucky when we're born? We're going to find out and not even realize that it's all about luck or, or good or bad luck. But there's a lot of that in the process. But you got to be there to take care, to take advantage of that good luck, of course, when it happens. I guess 7% compounded isn't that bad either. But yeah, compared every to 10 years, every yeah. 10 years, it doubles. Yeah. So, Paul, you've been involved in the investment business for almost 60 years. And is there any single investment that's good for all investors? Oh, yeah. There is one. There wasn't one when I came into the industry. There wasn't one when we met. But the investment that has been built, there are three investments that have changed the world in terms of what's to the good for the good interest of investors. The first one started in the 20s, 1920s, the mutual fund itself. It allowed a person with $1,000 to be treated like a multimillionaire. That was golden. Then you have to go all the way to 1976 before you have something that really, really changed this business. And that was the index fund. We didn't have an index fund when I started the business. But John Bogle introduced that in 1976. They laughed at him. They scoffed at him. And he built the most amazing mutual fund family, the Vanguard family, off of that commitment to low expenses and broad diversification. And he was laughing at all those active managers saying, we're going to beat you in the end. And he was right. But in 1993, uh, a fund was created that could own index funds inside. Now, not all of them do. So what I'm going to tell you about, there are good ones and there are others that aren't so good. But the good ones are made up of index funds inside uh, a fund of funds, if you will. By the way, you don't have to pay two expenses because you're buying this fund of funds. But inside the target date fund, are going to be, for a 21-year-old, almost all or all in equities, just like I would like them to be. And then as you get older, probably by the time you're 40, I'd like to have you in all equities until you're 40. For some people, even 45 or 50. But, but 40 is, I think, a good average point. You start adding bonds. But you see, a lot of people don't want to take that responsibility. So... You buy the mutual fund, the index fund, massive diversification, big companies, small companies, U.S., international, et cetera. And when you turn 40, they start adding bonds. And as you get older and older, they have more bonds in the portfolio to, to, to really manage the volatility. Because as you get older, you don't want to have all your money in equities. Most people don't. Some people do, but most don't because they can't take that volatility they don't want to lose half their money. At 80, I'm my wife and I are half in stocks and half in bonds because we want the growth, but you know, we're we're aggressive chickens because we want to have something that 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 cools the volatility down. That is all taken care of for you inside of the target date fund. So you graduate from college or you graduate from high school. You go to Vanguard or Fidelity or some other Schwab, some other company, and you put yourself in a target date fund that represents the year you would like to retire. And they manage it for you as best they know how from 21 to 91. Now, by the way, you're going to retire at, let's say, 65 or 70, but they keep on managing until you die. And you are not, this is a this is a study of studies for me. Wharton did a study of a million, $1.2 million 401k accounts at Vanguard. 
They looked at the returns of those people who were doing it on their own. They didn't need somebody to do it for them versus the people who had it all in target date funds. And the target date funds returns, the portfolios were built to make 2.3% more per year. I'm looking for a half a percent in the hopes of making you another million. And somebody is showing me a way that I don't have to do anything for 60, 70, 80 years. And Amazing. I'm going to make maybe 2% more. Market That's a big fund. deal. And one last thing about those funds, if you buy the right ones, the internal expense ratio to do everything for you is eight one hundredths of one percent. So I don't really, know really tiny. how to make anything. Oh, by the way, I would I would I would add that if you wanted to make more than just a target date fund, the last half of my book, We're Talking Millions, is about one baby step you could take that would make you probably a half to 1% more. Just a baby step. You're going to make us read your book. Okay. You know, <laughs> no, I won't do that to you. No, I will tell you, you put a little bit of money into a small cap value fund, smaller companies than the S&P 500, a long, long history of higher returns but more volatility, but it's going to be such a small part of your portfolio, you won't even think about it. Okay. So what about 529 accounts for little kids that parents can fund or grandparents can fund? Can... They're, they're, they are wonderful. They are wonderful because they allow that money that's do donated, invested, to uh, to grow tax free and distributed tax free, um, they too act like a target date fund because they're targeted to when that child is going to to start college, and and so I think that's a that's a great investment. Now I happen to be because you're th talking now about grandkids or kids for a second. One of the things I don't want to overlook is the implication of putting a few dollars away for a child or a grandchild. Let's say that you wanted to pay for the, create the income for one year of retirement at age 70. This was going to be the, the present from grandma and grandpa. What I would suggest that you do you put $365, obviously, $1 a day for a year. You put that into a small cap value fund. And they don't have an IRA yet. But you're going to put it there with the possibility that it will grow and grow, do whatever it's going to do. Don't, don't have to add any money. And when that, that child has some earned income, you can take whatever that $350 has grown to and you put it into the Roth IRA. Now this $365 and whatever it's grown to is under a tax sheltered account forever unless they change the tax code. And if that asset class, that index, does worse than it did the last I mean, it, it's like 13 point something percent since 1928. If it could get 12 percent, that one $365 at age 70, they would have a million dollars for a year. Wow. Now, if you really thought that was possible and you could find another 365 the next year, you do another one for when they're 71. I mean, there are little steps you can take and by the way, what a wonderful lesson. My wife and I gave money to our granddaughter. And uh, and and uh, the purpose of the money is to is to fund a 401k for 401k or a Roth IRA. And we put half the money in the S&P 500 and half the money in small cap value. And we think it'll have a huge impact. The problem we all have as parents and grandparents is how to do it so you keep their hands off the money. That is the difficult part about investing for everyone, not just our grandchildren.
been just so delightful talking to you and thank you. just thinking about you being 80 years old yeah. and you said you don't have that many years left i hope you're wrong but what's like what do you feel most passionate about other than financial literacy like what's what's important well, to you in your personal life it, that's that's a challenge uh, now i know the right answer uh, that people would want to give i love my family i love having great friends i actually personally don't need much money but it oftentimes is the fact that others around us do. So I don't, money just not, is not a focus of my personal life. Uh, on the other hand, I got to tell you, the chance to change people's lives, that is, uh, that is just, it's enchanting. It's, it's, it, it just like the siren song calls to those of us who like to do something for others. And I've always been a workaholic. So the fact that I get up at three or four in the morning now is no different than what it was like before, because I'm doing something that I truly love to do. And my family is very supportive of this, but I do love my time. We just had our two of our three daughters here with us this last weekend, and, uh, and it was heaven. Uh, on the other hand, they don't get me up at three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and the work does. So this is probably the, I can think of all of the spouses who probably wish that this person who cares so much about this project they're on, uh, uh, and, and, and by the way, my project at Western Washington University, I mean, this is over the top. I worked for 10 years to convince the administration there, and they're totally behind it, to offer financial literacy classes about 40 hours over four years to every student that goes through there. And that is going to change the, the lives of many of those kids' parents as well as them, their kids. And, uh, and I got to tell you, it's a high for me. It's, uh, it's, it's my drug, I guess. And, and so it's, it's hard to compete with that, but I try to be a good father. I try to be a good friend, but I know that others have to sacrifice, uh, for, for my passion. That is not unusual. Hmm. It sounds like the people who love you really understand your passion and support you. I, I think so. It doesn't mean that they wouldn't have rather have more of me and have a few a few people fewer that don't learn how to invest. But you know, this is these are the decisions that we uh, that we make. And uh, we hope that we do more good than we do harm. I think just by talking with me for this short amount of time, i I think you're going to make a lot of impact in the lives of the viewers who see this interview. And I'm so grateful to you because you, you weren't positive that you wanted to talk to me about this. Well, and, you know, I, Avis, you're, you're, I'm in the world of numbers, basically. Uh, this book about the biases uh, that uh, uh, it was written by one of our other directors <laughs> because uh the feeling part is not the part that I'm so good at. The numbers, that's the part that I focus on. And I wasn't really sure how am I going to combine my love of information and sharing information was going to fit with this project that you're on and your, your passion. Uh, and uh, I guess we're going to find out because... Uh, Hopefully, I, I make my email of, available to everybody, paul at paulmerriman.com. If, if, if they think that it was helpful, you know something? I would love the feedback. I don't make a penny for running the, uh, the uh, foundation. 
When I retired, I promised my wife I would never work for money again. And uh, and I haven't. Unfortunately, and I can say this, I guess, with a smile, she, she thought I said I would never work again. But, uh, you know, those There's are... There's a big difference between never working difference. again versus yeah. never working for money again. Yeah. Paul, you've just shared so much wisdom with us today. And... I really think it's going to make a big difference in the lives of I hope people so. who have listened Thank to you. you. And and I'm I'm going to tell people to to watch this because it's Great. so Thank illuminating. You, Mavis. Thank you so much, Paul. Yeah, and good luck with your your uh, passion. Thank you.